All right, all right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the world famous Tipitinas. Uh, we're here on stage at the club. Thank you very much to Tipitinas for allowing us to use the space, and thank you to Nugs.net for the use of the equipment. Uh, go online, Nugs.net, check out all their great content. Um, I, I was going to write out a big long intro for my next guest tonight, and uh, instead, I think I will just go ahead and do it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Stanton Moore. Yes, indeed. Cheers, well, brother. Cheers, brother. Right. Bottom clink. Yes, indeed. There you up. go. It's got some kick. Oh, that does have some kick. Yeah. And you were telling me about that. Yeah. That this is drawn from the barrels. Yeah, that it's they extracted make. from the bourbon barrels. Yeah. Man, that's uh, I it's would the expect. Devil's cut. I would expect nothing but something interesting from you, and that's fantastic. Uh, it's it's interesting. I I don't know where I caught on to it. Um, it's just good if you if, you know. I'm a fan of brown liquor, so yeah. I'm I'm all about brown liquor. Not I, all brown liquors, but it's. I, l I love it. I have to do it in moderation. No, everything should be done in moderation. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, so I understand you're in a band. Uh, I always forget the name. Yeah. Oh, Galactic. That's the name. Galactic or Galactica? Galactica. It's, it's amazing really how funny. many people yeah. have a hard time just saying Galactic. Well, it's even funnier when it's like, oh, man, my favorite band is Galactica. It's like... Is yeah, it, is it? You is, sure about is that? Is it your favorite band? <laughs> like, it's your favorite band. Maybe you should learn their damn name. Yeah. Um, not only are you in Galactic, uh, but you are in many other things. Um, I would say the other thing that probably keeps you the busiest outside of Galactic would be Stanton Moore Trio. Is that right? Yes, the trio. We were doing Tuesday nights at Snug Harbor, and we have traveled a good bit. Japan, New York, at the Blue Note. Seattle at Jazz Alley and then you know each one of those we've done like three times I think yeah. for multiple nights and then several festivals and stuff so it has kept me pretty busy and we have two records out and 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 it's something that I love doing because it is so different than mm -hmm. Galactic I mean I grew up playing on this stage mm -hmm. at tips with different things first and then and then galactic for over 20 years so people know me as a hard-hitting funk drummer which i love but I also coming up you know studied with johnny vodakovich yeah. and still to this day love shannon powell yeah. Herno and riley and love swinging out and playing in an interactive uh swinging idiom so i love doing that too so a few years ago i started the trio with david torkinowski mm -hmm. james singleton and killers both of them yeah, yeah yeah i mean just absolute monsters and you know i i decided i wanted to play in a more improv improvising improvisational way on a more regular basis yeah you know not just set it up and do a gig here do it there but do tuesday nights and i was lucky enough to start doing them at snug and it really started working on my finesse and my my interaction with people and it really started to develop a different side of my playing and i really started to love playing with brushes and playing ballads because you know playing a ballad you have to your time has to be spot on everything you play is is instantly audible so i found that as many times as i've played here and as many big festivals that I've played when I started playing snug where nobody's dancing and all eyes are on you and you're on a stage it's almost as high but people are sitting but right there you're right there it's yeah. like being under a musical microscope and it was much more dare I say frightening really yeah because I had grown comfortable playing playing in front of large audiences who are dancing and have a good time but then when you're playing in front of a small audience of, you know, Snug holds 80 people, but you're playing in front of a small audience and nobody's dancing mm -hmm. and people are looking at you, you're like, what are, what are they thinking about right now? Yeah. Are they thinking that this sounds, are they thinking, I hope they think this sounds good, and it, but then you don't know until you interact with them afterwards. Mm -hmm. So it was a much different scenario than playing on this stage. And so I've grown to love both of them e equally, but, but starting to play at Snuck was, was, was pretty daunting at first. And this is like home to me, and it, Snug has been become like a, snack, a second home, but it took a while. Yeah. Because, you know, when I first started playing here, you're like, oh my God, this is the same stage that the meters have played on. Mm -hmm. Dr. John, Alan Tucson, the Neville brothers. Well, all those guys have played on the Snug stage too, though. Yeah, yes, but but this this is where like they made a name for themselves. This is 
you know, when I started playing here as a teenager, this was legendary. So the first few times I started playing here, I'm looking up in the balcony. And of course, when I first started playing, there was nobody in the balcony. But <laughs> you're looking up there and you're just like, oh my God, like this is, you know, this, I'm, I'm, I'm literally in a, a historic setting right now. Mm-hmm. There's so much historic music has been played in, in this room from this stage. So it's interesting to sit here with you where it's just me and you yeah. in a bottle of, of bourbon and we're hanging out. Yeah, there's nobody here. This there's is, this is an empty here. room. Tanner, pan out so they can see yeah. that there's no one else in here. So, which is the first few times I came in here when it was empty, Yeah, you know, after we bought the club, it's like, wow, this is different. But now it's almost comforting in a way. You know, of course we want to fill it up again, but but it's 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 you feel like wow, this is such a historic, special place. I, I can't agree more. Uh, and and to be able to be in a position where we can be in here mm-hmm. and just have a conversation, it's a it's a different kind of feeling. And of course we can't wait until we can have people back in here. Obviously. But but you know, this on a on a Tuesday night, mm-hmm. you know, when we can't have live music, at least we can get together and talk. And it, and it feels really good to be on this stage in a different context, mm-hmm. you know? Well, I, I absolutely know. I, I don't specifically know how to explain it to a lot of people. You know, whenever someone comes by to pick up a T-shirt or buy a ticket routinely during normal times and, you know, normal daytime business hours, they'll come in and be like, wow, I've never been in here when there's no one else in here. And I understand how, how strange it must be. I remember the first time I was in here all by myself. You know, it's, it's, there's a certain magic even when it's an empty room. Right. Even if you're in here scrubbing the floors or sweeping or mopping or painting or cleaning a clogged toilet, whatever. Like, you're still in here by yourself and there's still a weird magic that exists in the walls. But more specifically, I, I don't know how to explain to people how cool it is that like, oh, I'm going to the office. Where's the office? It's Tipitina's. Right. You know, there's people go to offices. It's a building somewhere or it's, you know the back room of some other crappy place that they're not thrilled about. Like I get to come to work on sacred ground every day. Right. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you said there's a magic Mm -hmm. inside of here. And that's exactly what I was trying to say is that even being in here with nobody in here, it still feels special. And you, but you landed it better than I did. There's a magic (laughs) and nothing against snug. We, we do love snug. Oh, well, snug snug is magical too, but, but but I don't own snug. You're right. That's true. That's true. <laughs> well, we'll get into the, the more current times uh, as far as owning Tipitina's. Uh, I was doing a little bit of research um, before this, and I've known you for many years, so it seems funny to to do research on someone that I, that I feel is a friend already. But like even just trying to go through some of the list of credits, your resume is unlike any other human being's resume that I've ever seen <laughs> um, as far as just the amount of people that you've been not just on stage with, but in legit bands with, like actual outfits, not like, hey, is Stanton free on Tuesday? Maybe he can he can fill in for so-and-so on this date. Um, it, the, the list is absurd. Uh, I don't even know where to begin outside of, you know, your solo work, your, your Stanton Moore Trio, Dragon Smoke, Frequinox, uh, Garage de Chois, Klezmer All-Stars, Midnight Disturbers, the Street Sweeper Social Club, which is a cool one I want to ask you questions about, uh, Forgotten Souls Brass Band, more and more, MVVP, The Ivanhoes, Wrath of James, and Oxen Thrust. Yeah. Um, Don't forget Captain Meathead. Do- okay. <laughs> <laughs> and even doing this list, I was like, it's probably half the bands that you've been in. Well, I mentioned Captain Meathead because the guitar player singer is Scott Guyon, yeah. who is now the, the, artist. the two-time Jazz Fest poster artist. And, you know, back then, when we started a band together, when I was 16 years old, he was a great artist. And we're like, man, this guy's amazing. Mm. And now, just this year, the Jazz Fest that we didn't have, mm. he was... This was his second year doing the poster, yeah. so that that's why I mentioned that because he's fresh on my mind. Right. As, Captain Meathead, yeah. yeah, with a C A P apostrophe N, and <laughs> Captain, you know, yeah, Captain, and you know we, uh, of course, we've been talking about oh, should we do a reunion? And maybe, of course, we would love to do it here, but the reason I brought it up is because he's become a successful artist. I mean, he's always was great, and and he's always successful in my eye, but but I. Uh, it was just, I was waiting to see if you were going to say that one too. So that's. It didn't come up, oddly enough. <laughs> I'm surprised I couldn't find Captain Meathead. What kind of outfit, what, what kind of band was it? We were very much trying to blur the lines between punk and funk, 
and be something like a New Orleans version of the Minutemen meets. We, we weren't quite good enough yet to, to be a mix of the meters. <laughs> I was only 16 years old, but uh, 17 and 18, like, you know, we, we played in that band for a few years. And, you know, the Minutemen were kind of a blend of, 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 of different things with kind of some meters influence in there. And that's when I really started getting into the meters was playing in that band playing in that band yeah but it was you know supercharged fast kind of mixing punk with uh with other influences and one of them being the meters i mean it's no secret that the meters are you know to me they're, they're the beatles mm-hmm. <laughs> you know i mean to me they're the most important band of all time so I, I do not disagree with that for one second you started out when you began playing drums it was basically rock and roll influence though wasn't it? it was it was very rock and roll influenced and you know, I grew up listening to classic rock, listening to, I was, you know, practicing in my bedroom at the ages of 14, 15, 16, and practicing to Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath, Jimi Hendrix, Deep Purple, all of those things. And so, and The Who, and so all of those. Well, you mentioned Zeppelin, John, uh, John Bonham. John but, Bonham is one of my top three drummers of all time. But I had heard that his favorite drummer was Earl Palmer. Is that yes. right? Yes, right. and that that is accurate in that. So think about this. There's so much that John Bonham borrowed from Earl Palmer. And so John Bonham is one of my top three of all time. So my top three are Bonham, Elvin Jones, okay. and Ziggy Bumoto least, right? So when I say that John Bonham stole from Earl Palmer. I mean it with the utmost respect, right? Well, you guys all steal from each other, basically. That's how the, I mean, not to just sum up the New Orleans tradition, but it's not stealing. It's, I learned from this guy, and now I'm going to move forward with right. it. Right, and it's, it's being influenced and acknowledging those influences and acknowledging where they came from and then trying to do something that is your own take mm. on it. So John Bonham took a lot from Earl Palmer and one of the things he took was the intro from from rock and roll so it's been said that he took that intro from charles connor and that is accurate but that intro comes from before charles connor's intro into little richard's you keep a knocking right so the intro is right and then that's the intro into um, you keep a knocking, but you can't come in. Uh-huh. But that was also the rhythmic intro to banana yeah. Chuck, uh, Chuck Berry, but Chuck Berry got it from Lewis Jordan. Lewis Jordan, 1948, ain't that like a woman? So it's called the jump intro. It's the same. It's the same intro. Da 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 da. Right, and then John Bonham played it in his way but i think john bonham got it from from earl palmer's intro to to eddie cochran's something else eddie cochran's something else goes something very similar to to chuck berry's okay so you know why i think that bonham got it from from earl palmer's intro to something else why because Led Zeppelin played something else as a cover in 1969. Really? Before they recorded rock and roll. So I'm not saying that he didn't get it from Chuck Connor too, but I know for a fact because he played it as a cover. He played something else, which is Earl Palmer. So it's been it's been discussed where did Bonham really get that intro? And yes, I'm sure he heard Little Richard and and Chuck Connor, but but I know that he heard something else two with with earl palmer so that's how much john bonham was influenced by earl palmer is that he basically played a note for note intro to earl palmer and charles connor <laughs> both new orleans drummers yeah right so new orleans drumming to me is like i mean it's 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 ground zero it is it is the the beginning of of drum set playing and of course new orleans drumming comes from from Africa mm-hmm. and the horrible forced migration that happened with slavery. And we have to acknowledge that. We have to absolutely. talk about it. And it, it was absolutely horrific. And 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 the African culture 
that came from Africa through Haiti, through Cuba, and eventually wound up in New Orleans. New Orleans was the only place in the United States that allowed people who were forced into slavery to practice their religion, dance, and song. And so sell goods and... And, act. yes, and mm-hmm. have, have a marketplace. And we, we know this. I'm not saying anything that, that isn't already talked a lot mm-hmm. about. But in New Orleans, you've got that African culture, and you've got it mixing with European culture, mm-hmm. mixing with, with snare drums and bass drums, and that becomes the drum set. And then the drum set, to me, what's played on it, all has its roots in New Orleans, which of course has its roots in Africa. But to me, New Orleans is so important, you know? And and to know how much John Bonham got from Earl Palmer, it's just like, yep. And it's it's clear influence into how much it's, you know, coalesced into all popular music essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're you're an absolute student now i'm kind of half wishing we had done this like at a drum kit and pulled out the drums and like <laughs> why didn't we just set up the kit and just let you sit back there well and, there's always there's always part two yeah we, we can definitely come back and do that again i i'm just i i'm not a musician i'm not a drummer so it's going to be right over my head unfortunately oh, that's I'm, all right this is something more suited for your master class which is something else i wanted to ask you about uh the stanton Moore drum academy yes um how long ago did you start this? it's been a few years now yeah i launched it we went live in 2016 Mm -hmm. in October of 2016 but I had been filming lessons for it and writing lessons for it I think three let three years before that Mm -hmm. so it's it's been something that I've been working on for a while but I for years have loved teaching and really it's just sharing all this drumming knowledge that I've accumulated over now almost a 30 year career, Mm -hmm. 25 years on the road with Galactic, but I started gigging several years before that. And so, you know, it's almost 30 years of being, of playing professionally. I love being able to write out a lesson or film a lesson, put it out into the world. And in a year, two, three, four, five years later, somebody comes to me and says, man, what you wrote in that lesson or what you explained in that lesson set off a light bulb for me and it really changed my playing. And I know how much time I had to put in to learn it, then to write it out or film it, but then for them to practice it and learn it and internalize it, I know that they had to practice it and and live with it for months, if not years. So the connection, when you can change somebody's approach to drumming or music and then that hopefully enhances their quality of life then you feel like wow I really had a connection with this person and it's a connection that's on such a deep level when you're playing here and you see people dancing and having a great time that's awesome and that's great but you know they're going to go about their lives and but when you spend months I mean years learning this stuff and then months writing it and then you know all this time filming it editing it getting it out there then they spend all that time internalizing it you know it meant something to them it meant something to me and now it means something to them that's like after several of those interactions you're like wow i really love this like i love teaching and I love sharing this knowledge so I could see how it was headed I could see that was headed you know if I tour in Japan with Galactic and reach drummers there and tour in Europe and and you know South America and you know all these different places that we've been then I realized I can't reach those people all the time but if I put these lessons up online then I can reach these people that have spent the last 25 years touring to reach I can reach them through an online setting where I share this drumming knowledge with them that way. Mm -hmm. So I could kind of see the writing on the wall that it was heading that way. There are several guys who have led that charge and who are doing great with it. And I I could see that it was going in that direction. Mm -hmm. Just as you could see, you know, things started off in magazines and then uh, guys started filming on VHS tape where you could see a VHS tape was going to be a thing of the past. Yeah. Then go to DVDs, and that's going to be a thing of the past. And then so you have to adapt 
as you go. Absolutely. Uh, this this early notion, or not even early, just this notion of education, did you pick that up from your early mentors? I know uh, you went to Brother Martin and studied under Marty Hurley and got a lot of your uh, rudimentary skills up to snuff. And then while that was going on, while in high school, started learning from guys like Johnny Vidakovich and Russell Batiste. One million percent, and, yeah. And, you know, uh, the, the list goes on and on. Is that where your, you know, grown up self wanted to start getting into education? Did it come from that? Yes, because I appreciated as I started to develop and started to to gain a little traction and guys started coming up and asking me questions, I started to appreciate how how generous those guys were with me. Mm-hmm. Johnny Johnny V, Marty Hurley, Russell Batiste, those, those three guys in particular, when I was 17, 18 years old, still in high school, I started following Johnny V around and, and Russell Batiste, and then I would sit in at Benny's on a Russell Batiste <laughs> gig and bring his drums home for him, and then You're show up. Russell's tech? I was, yep, I was. I might have been with, I'm, I think I was his first one, to be honest <laughs> with you. Because <laughs> I walked up to him, first time I saw him, he was playing with George Porter Jr. in the quad at Tulane, and I walked up to him and said, I said, I mean, it was a religious experience for me. I mean, I mean, it was like a near outer body experience for me the first time I saw Russell. Was it a running partners gig? It or was, it meters? was running partners, right. and it was in the Tulane quad, and I was like 17, I think, and... You know, had long hair and had my shirt off, and I thought I was, you know, becoming hot stuff on my own. <laughs> and I saw Russell, and Russell had his shirt off, and he, and he was like just ripped at that time, right? <laughs> and um, and just I mean, playing the most funky, energetic, unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. I was just like, the closer I got, the more excited I got. And I was like, oh, my God. And by the time I got to the side of the stage, I was, like, jumping up and down. He came off the stage. I was like, I've never seen anything like that in my life. Mm-hmm. I want to study with you. I want to learn from you. <clears throat> I want I want you to be my guy. You mm-hmm. know, like, I, I want <laughs> I want to, you know, I want to be like you, you know, basically. Um, and he's like, man, I, I don't know nothing about teaching no lessons, but. But we can hang out. And so I started just showing up to his rehearsals with Dawson's Attack and, uh, you know, John Dawson, all right, you know, rest in peace. And mm. and uh, and those guys started letting me sit in at rehearsals and bring Russell's drums and sound check for him. Eventually I started doing that with George Porter Jr. too. Mm. And uh, eventually filled in for Russell with George Porter Jr. And, um, you know, that – Russell was always – super open to me and so was johnny v mm-hmm. i would go over to johnny v's house for an hour lesson three hours later he'd be like oh my goodness i didn't realize what time it is i gotta get my butt to snug harbor like, i'm gonna be late for my gig <laughs> and so you know those guys were so open with me mm-hmm. you know and marty hurley too i took private lessons with him and those guys were like if you want to learn then we'll show you mm-hmm. right so once i started getting to, into a position where where drummers were coming up to me and asking me, man, how do you do that? Like, where'd you learn that? Like, where'd that come from? I was like, come on, mm-hmm. let me show you. And then a, a drum magazine called Drum Magazine reached out to me to, to start writing a column about New Orleans drumming. And I was like, I don't know anything about writing a column. Mm-hmm. But I started doing it. And then a publisher by the name of Sandy Feldstein, who was like a godfather in the the drumming education world, he was, um, I was brought to his attention and he was like, you know, you, you might have a book here if you flesh all this out. I had like 12 columns at that time that I'd written over like 12 episodes, you know, 12 issues. And um, at the time they were coming out like every month and a half. And... And then once he started editing and checking out my book, he's like, you might have a DVD here. And then once the book was out in the world and the DVD, and I started getting the impact from that, then that's when it really like took hold. And wow. I was really like, man, I love doing this. Well, um, so in high school, uh, Brother Martin, like we said, studying under Marty Hurley, uh, you became captain of the drum corps, is that correct? I, I did, yeah. Was that 
difficult. But was there anyone else in your class uh, in the band those years that are still playing? Yeah. So Kyle Malanson, who plays uh, who plays with Imagination Movers, uh-huh. he he was a year older than me, and we were really good buddies at the time, and we're we're still friends. Mm-hmm. And he was friends with Scott Guyon too, but he was a year older than me, and so. Once he graduated, um, there were guys who were in my class mm-hmm. when we were all juniors, and uh, one of those guys was the captain when we were juniors, right? And I was like, man, I've got a chance to like beat all these guys out. <laughs> so I started really working hard. I started taking lessons from Marty Hurley, and, and I did. I, I became the drum captain because there was another guy who was in my – in my class who was drum captain and then I, I, I beat them out and they weren't too happy about that but I was like this is what I'm going to do for my life like I knew this mm-hmm. right and I I also won I set those goals to become the drum captain and win all state on drum set because I knew that would help me get a scholarship and I wanted to go to Loyola to study so I could be close to Johnny V mm-hmm. and still go here. Guys like Russell and Shannon Powell. And still live in the neighborhood. And, and, yeah, yeah, and still be here. I, I realized how important New Orleans drumming was at that time. And I thought about going to other schools, but I was like, man, I really want to be a New Orleans drummer. Mm-hmm. Like, I want to play at Tips. I want to play at Stug Harbor. I want to sound like Russell Baptiste, Johnny Vodakovich, Shannon Powell, and Herlin Riley all rolled into one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's that's kind of the most amazing part, you know, the way that you just mentioned all these different people that you wanted to sound like and you wanted to play with. So many people, you know, that are coming up into rock and roll music, often they stick with rock and roll, and that's what they want to do all the time. But, you know, like we said, you're learning, you know, high school marching band and then learning from Johnny Vodakovich, which is heavily jazz, acid jazz oriented, and Russell Batiste, which is one of the funkiest people that's walked the planet, you know? Yeah. Like the idea of having all these different genres of music influence you. What is it about all those different styles? And is there ever been any style that of drumming that maybe you don't enjoy as much? Sure. So what what it is about those styles is that, you know, I love music and all of those styles impacted me on an emotional level. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, my God, this music is moving me. Like, I would go see Astral Project at Snow Harbor, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is amazing. This is totally moving me. And then I would come here or, you know, and hear the funky meters with Russell Baptiste on drums or go hear Russell somewhere else. I'm like, oh, my God, this is moving me. Like, mm-hmm. And then, you know, on another night, I might hear Shannon, uh, you know, playing at Press Hall or, you know, playing with anybody that he would be playing with. And then hearing... Here in Hurling, you know, and then keep in mind at this time, Brian Blade was in town. And so, you know, Brian to me is one of the greatest drummers that's ever, ever, you know, ever been born. So, so I, I was absorbing all of this and, and all of it was moving me on an emotional level. So I was like, I want to be able to play at least my version of that mm-hmm. i at least want to be able to to play in that musical context and have something to say mm-hmm. i knew that i wouldn't be able to sound exactly like any of those guys individually but maybe i could sound like a blend or a mix and and put it into my own personal blender and come out sounding like something different which would hopefully sound like me well, it, I think it's absolutely different in that if, if you were to ask anyone what type of drummer is Stanton Moore, I think you'd get a thousand different answers. There's, <laughs> there's, you can't be pinned down is basically what I'm getting to with all this. Like, there's, there's no end to what you are able to do with a drum set, well, I think. Thank you for saying that. It's and not a question. It's a compliment. You're welcome. Well, well, well no, I thank you for saying that, and, and I appreciate that. And, and that's, that's great to hear and because – I still love learning. I still, mm-hmm. you know, in the last 10 years, I've spent a lot of time learning, practicing brushes, right? And, mm-hmm. you know, played mostly all brushes on the Walter Wolfman Washington record that Ben produced. And Ben called me because he knew how much I'd been practicing brushes. And I'm listening to that record. It's like, 
there's no way I could have even imagined that I could play like that when I was 17. But you fall in love with music and then you fall in love with, oh, well, now I love playing ballads. Now I love playing with brushes. And I think I've developed my own voice with that. And so I love, you know, one of the ones that you didn't mention was uh, recording with, with Pepper Keenan and Corrosion of Conformity. Well, it was, it's on my list. of like I, I wrote down 20 different band names, right. and I only read off the first dozen. So. But, you know, playing, I love Black Sabbath. I love blues-based heavy music, right, mm. which is totally where Pepper and, and, and COC were coming from on that record. And so I loved doing that, and then I love playing Brushes with, with – Walter Wolfman Washington. I loved playing on Irma Thomas's record that, you know, kudos to Irma. She won a Grammy. I was going to say, you are listed as a Grammy winner for that, but <laughs> nothing against you. Irma deserves all Irma, the credit. Irma anything. won that Grammy. Yeah. I got I got acknowledged and got a certificate. You got it also featuring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, it, Irma deserved, and she, she won that Grammy. But I, I'm just honored that I've, that I've been able to to fall in love with all those different types of music and and be able to be called upon to to say my own have my own voice within that music i've i I know i can't sound like brian blade i can't sound like johnny vodakovich i can't sound like russell batiste but i could sound like some kind of some kind of mix of those that comes out as myself and 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 apply that to lots of different styles and settings and that's what i've sought out to do and I think I'm starting to do it a little bit. You think? Okay. That's, <laughs> at least you're starting. <laughs> so uh, around this time at the end of high school, beginning of college, like you said, 17, 18 years old, when you first started, you know, uh, you know, puppy dog and Russell Batiste and following him around is probably totally when. Totally puppy dog. Yeah. Him. Just, just, I'm, I'm sure it was just inherently all I want to do is play funk music because of this man. Oh, God, And yeah. luckily this is about the time where you meet Robert and Jeff. Yeah, Exactly. And, and, you know, and also, let's not forget that, you know, my, my three favorite drummers, as we said, are, are Elvin Jones, John Bonham, and Zigaboo Modalese. Mm-hmm. But Zig wasn't living in town no. at the time. So, so when I, I was also falling in love with all the recordings that Zig had made, but he wasn't really playing in town at the time and, uh, and, and was living in Oakland at the time, right? So, so yes, I was puppy dog and Russell and and wanting to play funk, but I, I don't want to forget that how how much of an impact and and yeah, where influence did he, where did his Zig influence come had from? on me mm-hmm. too. So I'm I'm like trying to sound like a mix between Russell Batiste, Zigaboo Modalist, and some of Johnny Vodakovich's snare drum stuff, mm-hmm. right? And and that's and that's when I met. Robert Mercurio and Jeff Raines, and I think I met Jeff Raines for the first time standing in the middle of the floor. I have to be honest, I had done a jam session with Robert Mercurio at a friend of ours' house, Rob Gowan, and then I came out to hear Smiling Myron. Smile, yeah. And I was standing in the, in the middle of the floor and bumped into Robert, and he was like, oh, hey, Stanton, this is my buddy Jeff. He's the guitar player in the band I was telling you that I play in, the band called Galactic Prophylactic. <laughs> and here's my buddy Jeff. And, you know, we're wondering if you might know any drummers who might want to play funk with us because we know you're already busy playing, you know, playing stuff. I was already doing some gigs and stuff and, and also, you know, still in Loyola at the time. I was like, I'm not too busy to play funk. I was like... <laughs> Obviously, he had just met you, and he hadn't known you for however many decades and how many different shows and everything else you've done. Right. So, you know, I was like, I, I want to play funk. I was like, I'll come play with y'all. And so they were like, really? I was like, yeah, absolutely. So I went over to their house during the holiday break of 1992 mm. and started playing with Robert Mercurio and Jeff Raines. <laughs> <laughs> well, so those early days, so you were – part of the galactic prophylactic i was um which ultimately ended up dropping the prophylactic yes as many kids do so so, (laughs) don't 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 drop that though yeah yeah but that was uh, at the behest uh, according to robert to uh dan prothero yeah is that right yeah yeah so i think we we gigged 
a lot in 93 as Galactic Prophylactic, and then uh, a little in 94, and then revamped and um, and released cooling off in like 96 as mm. Galactic. So but you guys were waiting, I know, I, according to Robert, Jeff was the one you were waiting on to graduate so you could guys hit the road yeah. and, and take this thing and, and try and push this, this new type of funk that you had. Yeah, and we, we knew when we had the core of Robert, Jeff, and Rich, mm. we knew that the four of us was something that we wanted to retain as the core. And then we had different horn players, and it, but on the first tour, right, of the West Coast, Ben Elman came out with us. Mm. And then we started to develop a rapport with Ben, and he very quickly, we were like, okay, this, this is the five of us. Like, the, the five of us is, the core that we that we want to pursue you know you had already known ben and played with him in klezmer's by then right oh yeah yeah and that's that's how i kind of said well we can get this guy ben elman that i've been playing <laughs> klezmer gigs with he's from california i think Maybe yeah he'll come to the yeah West he'll come too. and play with us out here uh so obviously and then galactic ensues uh very much to the the happiness of of the the world not that again not, not to feed you too much of a compliment um, I, I'm absolutely 100% positive that you would still become the drum superstar that you are, Galactic or not. <laughs> well, uh, but lucky you. for us that Galactic ended up working, and it was a totally awesome project that, that seemed to have panned out. Yeah, Hopefully. I mean, I, I love it. It's home base for me. You know, they're my brothers and uh, now, you know, business partners. And um, it's, you know, it's something that I love doing. Even though I love doing all these other things, you know, I love Galactic and it, it's, it, it feels like home and it's, it, it's, you know, it always has been, I mean, 25 years now. Oh. So. <laughs> I think one of the things that uh, a lot of people don't understand or maybe they don't quite realize is how busy Galactic is all the time, which is extremely busy, obviously, but to think that you are still finding a lot of extra gigs to play when you're not playing galactic gigs it's almost as if you can't sit still do, do you get that feeling oh yeah you're, you're on the road for weeks you come home and the day after you come home it's like oh time to put the suit on i got a gig at snug you know yeah. is is do you ever see a time uh, well obviously aside from a time like this is there a time that you don't envision yourself even if uh, Galactic decades from now decides, hey, we're going to hang up the spurs and hit, stop hitting the road. Do you ever see yourself not performing live in front of people? No. Um, I say that, and right now we can't. But but in short answer, no. Because, you know, I love playing the drums every single day, mm -hmm. right? I, I don't necessarily always love traveling in a way that we're in a different place every single day mm -hmm. but i love playing the drums and i love working every mm -hmm. single day so you know to me being able to to walk up to the drums and play either in a studio during the daytime or at night on a gig i, I love that and i want to keep doing that indefinitely you know mm -hmm. i mean that's the great thing about being a musician and being a drummer is that you know so many drummers play into their 80s mm -hmm. and even further you know Roy Haynes still playing in his 90s you yeah. know so so I think that I love doing it and I I want to follow in those footsteps I want to still be doing this you know 40 years from now so <laughs> no I we, we certainly hope you do when you were talking about doing cooling off with Galactic you guys record that at Alan Toussaint studio C Saint is that yes. correct and when you actually finally got to meet him, he didn't even realize that you guys had played or recorded your album in there. Is that right? That's true. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, that's how much we revere and, and, and love the meters and Alan Tucson and the history of new Orleans music is that when we made our first record, we we're like, you mean you could still go record in sea saint. So, mm -hmm. so, so we did, we booked <laughs> two days in sea saint and we went and recorded our record. And then in between recording the record and getting the record out, we we weren't ready to tour yet because we didn't have a record. Mm -hmm. Jeff wasn't out of school yet. And, um, and we didn't really have 
we had kind of disbanded a galactic prophylactic and we were trying to figure out what galactic was going to be mm-hmm. and we hadn't really started doing a lot of gigs as galactic with the new horn section and Thero the house man to clue it and all that so we started a little four-piece instrumental band called the ivan hose mm-hmm. just to play some gigs and play instrumental meter stuff as a project like mm-hmm. as a as a learning experience mm-hmm. right and then a gentleman by the name of lee bates heard us and really liked what we were doing and asked us to come in and record at c saint playing some of these meters instrumentals mm-hmm. and then he introduced us to alan and we went and had a meeting with alan in his office upstairs at c saint and it was like a like a time capsule of 1974 <laughs> and it was amazing in what way was it a time capsule it's green shag carpet and nice. the mahogany desk and the decor you know i mean it was like it was it was unchanged everything you wanted it to be oh man it was amazing and right on. And so Alan talked to us and we told him about what we had been doing and that we recorded a record here at C. St. already. It was coming out and he says, well, it sounds like y'all are on your way. <laughs> so, so, and then we did work with Alan later when we sent him a couple tunes and he wrote vocals and, and put some keys and sang on two of our tunes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also... Um, you put out with you in mind after his passing. Tell me a little bit about that. Yes. So I was working on a record that was going to be another trio record, mm-hmm. and we were working on material, things that James Singleton had wrote, things that other New Orleans composers had wrote. And as we were starting to prepare and and rehearse for this record, Alan passed, and... Mm-hmm. And David Torganowski, who had worked a lot with Alan, said, you know, we should really pay some kind of tribute to Alan. And come to find out, you know, Torque was meaning, like, maybe we do a song or two. Mm -hmm. So to me, I'm like, oh, that's that's great. And, you know, I, I tend to, like jump on board with something and then, like, take it as far as it can go. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking yeah that's great let's you know let's make a whole record that way and so it happened pretty organically in that we started working on tunes we're like you know who would sound great singing this is cyril neville Mm -hmm. you know who would sound great on horns on this is nicholas payton donald harrison jr and trombone shorty you know like heaven's horn section yeah you know um ideal band i would say yeah i mean really incredible and so we just started kept adding to it and having more and more more and more special guests Mm. and wound up having erica falls and um sing on it a little bit and uh and kiki phillips sing on it and and eric bloom played on it aaron fletcher mark mullins mike dylan played percussion on it so, you know, we really had a, a quite an ensemble of special guests and, and I'm really, really proud of that record and and uh and it just felt right in that moment to to pay homage to to Alan because he's contributed so much to the tapestry and the soundtrack of New Orleans and and the world. And the world. Yeah. And you realize that without Alan you know the soundtrack of new orleans would sound a lot different you know and i in my opinion not nearly as good (laughs) you know i mean he just really added so much you know so it it felt very natural to to make that record in in homage to him during this time have you been writing a lot of uh material for stanton more trio i know right now galactic is still working on putting out the next record you guys uh have recorded a lot of stuff and i know that they've been in the studio trying to mix it and master it and, and get it out hopefully this year maybe fingers crossed yeah. i guess um for stanton moore trio material are you is that just a constant always trying to get material or do you kind of wait till you're in studio with 
Torque or Singleton or whoever else you feel like collaborating with? Is that a constant process or do you do you kind of sit on that? So with a trio, we usually do rehearsals at my house mm -hmm. and then work out songs, playing them live at Snug. And then our plan is to, I think I, I want to make my next record live at Snug, mm -hmm. but all new songs, not songs that we've done before. So, you know, a lot of times you make a live record and it's part of your repertoire that you... Yeah, it's just you're digging back through the catalog. Right. Yeah. Part of your repertoire that you've recorded already. I want to make a record that is going to be a live record, but a material that has we haven't played yet. Mm -hmm. So, through all of this, we haven't really been able to get together in the way that the trio gets together. So, I've been writing a lot of drum lessons mm -hmm. and I've been filming a lot of drum lessons with just me and my my engineer because mm -hmm. that feels safe and when we're in there we're wearing masks until I have to start talking on camera mm -hmm. and so we just haven't really until we're gonna actually do a live stream at the Columns Hotel coming up with the trio I didn't see but, that. It's, but it's a live stream without an audience mm -hmm. so um, we're starting to feel a little comfortable getting together with the trio mm -hmm. um, but it's it's taken a little while for us to get to the point where we feel comfortable working in the way that we work with galactic i'll record drums and then robert can play bass on it and then maybe he'll call rich to come play and play some keys on it maybe get jeff to play some guitar on it ben will play some horns on it and then eventually i'll go in and re-record all the drums mm -hmm. right so we can work kind of the way that galactic works a lot it's kind of it works for for quarantine in the way that we don't have to put a lot You're of people in piece by piece yeah we don't have to put everybody in the room at the same time mm -hmm. so we've been able to make progress with the galactic record mm -hmm. um and then now i'm really excited to go in and do a live stream with the trio mm -hmm. and i'm i'm hoping that we'll be able to continue doing that as long as you know we have to be operating on this level mm -hmm. well at the very least i know of a, a place where you can rehearse where you can three of you scatter around pretty easily and stay pretty distant yeah i know right this, this this looks like a pretty workable situation no not anymore though we've we've nailed the table down this is no longer for <laughs> interviews only yeah right yeah right um uh speaking of interviews only uh in the studio you have your own interview show if i'm not I mistaken i do i do in a room which is one of the coolest looking rooms i've ever seen that if anyone hasn't seen it, uh, you've got great interviews with Keith Carlock and Adam Deich. And uh, do you have any other? You've got yes. a few other interviews. George Coleus, who mm -hmm. is an amazing speed metal, death metal mm -hmm. drummer, but he's a really good friend of mine, wonderful dude. And I met him through doing drum events. And, mm -hmm. you know, drummers, we, we get along really easily because we're just like, hey, you hit stuff, I hit stuff too. Let's be <laughs> friends. <laughs> so. You know, we a lot of different drummers that play a lot of different genres, it's easy for drummers to become friends. You know, mm. we, we become friends pretty easily. So George loves playing funk, and we became buddies. And, and then Ron Dinette, uh is a drum maker, drum manufacturer, who makes my signature snares, which we have one here mm -hmm. as one of the house snares and tips. So, so far, those are some of the interviews I've done. I'm hoping to expand it and start doing things I want to do one with my buddy Tori McPhail, mm -hmm. head chef, and executive not just, chef. Yeah, not just musicians. Yeah, sorry to cut you off. Tori McPhail, uh, executive chef at uh, Commander's Palace. No small feat to get that job. Yeah, quite incredible. And he's been holding that job down for, I think, 18 years now. We've become friends. I want to have him come in and eventually, you know, chefs and, and, and different lines of work. But the, I've got those leather chairs set up in my studio and Beautiful. I've got drums all around and... And I'm set up, ready to play, ready to talk, and you know, it's I've been on the road, so so I'm starting to get in there a little bit more. But now we've also been quarantined, and mm -hmm. so I'm I'm getting in there more, and and it's a great space, and you know, I just plan on continuing to play and talk about drums for as long as I can. Well, it's definitely a great space, and like I said, it's how much stuff you got in there. Yeah. So last time I counted, I think I have. Now, in that room, I'd have to count, but it, things, you know, drums that I own, I think I own about 30 bass drums and about 50 snare drums. But, and then, you know, 
some of my kits are like three different bass drums, like an mm. 18, a 20, and a 26. So do you count that as, you know, because a, a bass drum, snare drum, hi-hat, and a ride could be a, a kit, you know? Yeah, well, you, you can mix and match, you yeah. know, dozens of different styles. Exactly. Yeah. So some of my kits are a whole bunch of drums, you know, what we call a shell bank, kind of mm. like what we have here. You mm. know, we've got an 18, a 20, a 22, and we've got, you know, three rack toms and two four times like how many drum sets is that you know what i mean mm -hmm. so I, I count bass drums and snare drums and i mean a whole bunch of different toms but i've got about 30 bass drums and maybe about 50 snare drums well shout out to gretch for the uh, stanton moore signature kit that we have here yeah uh, or is, what it's a signature color if i'm not mistaken well it's it's a color it's a actually it's a color that they it's just one of the classic offerable colors that they have in that line mm -hmm. keith has played that color mm -hmm. and um it's a classic color that that i just think would look great in this in this uh setting right and and so when we did do gretch night at tipitina's and had myself and keith keith played those drums and mm -hmm. he was right at home you know because he's got a kit just like it absolutely so kudos to gretch for for setting up tipitina's with a house kit as soon as we as soon as we as galactic closed you know i started reaching out to them they're like sure no problem mm -hmm. well you've got your signature line of sticks drums and cymbals if i'm not mistaken right yes well i had a signature line of cymbals with sabian mm -hmm. and then i've recently joined with zildjian, zildjian. and I, I i'm very happy with 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 that you know the the team at zildjian they've been great to me and I've been with Vic Firth for years. Mm -hmm. And then, for the sticks. Mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. And then Zildjian bought Vic Firth. Mm -hmm. So then, members of the team that I've been working with for years with Vic Firth have now become part of the team with Zildjian. So it's just a very natural fit now mm -hmm. that guys that I've been working with for years are now, they're doing great inside of the team at mm -hmm. Zildjian. And I've been with these guys for years at Vic Firth. So it just felt like a very natural transition and I, i've been very happy and and zildjian has made me incredible incredible models that that are basically replicas of what i what i've been playing for years mm -hmm. and um based out of their their corrope series too so they use bodies of corrupts to make what i want and the corrupts are like their classic k's vintage k's from the, from the 60s and I've collected those over the years and so it's like it's like a whole full circle coming back you know I have a picture of myself when I was I think 16 or 17 wearing a Zildjian hat mm -hmm. at the same age that we're talking about when I started following around Johnny Vodakovic and, and Russell Batiste and we we published that picture of me wearing a Zildjian hat at that age nice. when we announced that I was gonna move to Zildjian so well, what's what's the next sponsorship you got coming on? Man, hopefully Jim Beam. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's there's another product, uh, food more specifically. I, I brought this up the other day with uh, Robert. The uh, the Stanton has a signature po' boy, as a matter of fact, over at Guys called the Bomb. You want to tell us about the Bomb? Yeah. So <laughs> we're giving a plug to the po' boy shop in the neighborhood. Yeah, Guys Po' Boys and Marvin over there, at Guys Po' Boys. You know, so the Galactic House, where Robert Mercurio, Jeff Raines, and Chris Chris Lane, they lived in that house. Chris Lane was the, the singer. He was the singer of Galactic Prophylactic. And then eventually, I moved into that house. And so, Guys Po' Boys is across the street from that house, mm. on the same side of Magazine, on the other side of Valmont. And so, we would go in there and eat all the time, and Jeff would catch catch stuff fishing and bring it in there and Marvin would cook it up for us but I love to you know come up with different things I'm not I'm not really a, a cook or a chef yet but I like to combine things you mm. know um, I, I've, I have cooked a couple times with, with Tori where Tori's like all right you know you do it 
And like he's standing right next to me. He's like, "What do you think? What do you want to do? What do you want to try? Like, what do you want to mix with?" You might as well hand him some drumsticks and be like, "Play me a tune." Right? Well, that's what I told him. I was like, "Look, I'm willing to do this, but you got to realize how daunting this is. Imagine if I would hand you sticks and ask you to sit down and play for me." Because, "Aha, good point." (laughs) So I love coming up with things food-wise. And so I said, "Marvin, I got an idea for a po' boy. How about grilled catfish?" with grilled shrimp on top and then Swiss and cheddar cheese. And Marvin said, man, you can't put cheese on seafood. I said, <laughs> I said, yeah, you can. I said, just tr- make it for me. And then I started bringing people in there and then people started talking about it. And now I, I kind of thought maybe he had forgotten about it, but he's like, no, bro, people order. It's on the menu. The bomb all the time yeah. and it's on the menu. But he says, you know, in these times, probably not a good idea to call anything the bomb so he's like we're gonna have to rename it to stanton special so we'll we'll see whatever he wants to call it i'm just honored that it's still around after all these years and then it's still attributed to me mm-hmm. <laughs> is there a second po boy would you come up with another one? Oh sure man i can come up with po boys all day long <laughs> <laughs> i mean look imagine this an uh, oyster po' boy with crab meat au gratin on top of it. That's pretty good. Right? That's a good one. Come on, man. I could do this all day. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, we'll get uh, next week, we'll, we'll get a hold of Tori and get Chef Tori McPhail in here. Yeah, start, we should get him know, in here. Cooking for us. Uh, is there a job that you've ever had besides musician? Yeah. Believe it or not, I was a filler bagger at Popeye's. Yeah? Yeah. And that what that is is... It's like, it's pretty much low man on the totem pole. It's after they put the chicken in the in the box. Back then, it used to go in a box. And then you would have to put the chicken and, the, you know, the box and the red beans and the spork and the napkins in the bag. Mm-hmm. So there was a, a, I was like 16 or something. And I would ride my little mongoose BMX from my parents' house through the neighborhood to the Popeye's. Uh, that's very close to, to Power Boulevard mm-hmm. and uh, David Drive and, and Veterans. And I had that job for several months. Filler bagger at Popeye's. <laughs> Can't believe that wasn't on my research. I, was, I, was, I, I assume the answer was no. No, I've never done anything. I've always yeah, been I've, I've, I've done that and a couple other little things, but for only for very little bits of time. I've mostly been a musician. Popeyes is rolling, man. So maybe you can pick up the old gig. You know, hey, look, I'm hoping to pick up a sponsorship. <laughs> we want Popeyes Bring me some to sponsor Tipitinas. Bring me some sandwiches. Well, I guess your your other job would be teacher. You you know, recently, uh, as of at least last year, started working at Louisiana State University. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So Professor Brett Dietz reached out to me, and he's been trying to get me to come teach over there for a while and I really have enjoyed it it's been great you know I do have a rudimental background they have a drum line so a lot of my concepts in the last several years have been more intermediate level concepts where if somebody has a rudimental background Mm -hmm. if they're beyond the beginner stage and have a, a decent rudimental foundation I can take that foundation I could show them some of the rudimental things and show them how to turn it into something really cool on the drum set mm-hmm. so I knew that if I went over to LSU I'd be able to apply that concept and be able to really hone it firsthand with all these kids because I know how the, Dr. Brett Dietz teaches them in the percussion section and then how they the skills that they have to know if they play on the drum line too, right? So I knew I'd be working with a bunch of kids who had a bunch of students who had who had a background in rudimental drumming, just like I did. So I knew I'd be relating on their level, and it's been awesome, and I've loved it. And, you know, I would like to think that, that maybe, you know, my going there to teach had just a little something to do with them winning the national championship this year. I think it's... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely correlated. So, Absolutely. Uh, of the students there, there is it is it a lot of kids from all over the country, or are you finding that it's mostly kids from Louisiana at LSU? It's, it's kids from in the music program. Yeah, there, there are kids from from a lot of different areas, but there's definitely a lot of kids from Southern Louisiana and and Texas and and the surrounding areas, and 
and uh, and so there's definitely a concentration of kids from around around these areas. Well, I would assume it's it's something where at the very least you do all of these you know the Stanton Moore Drum Academy and everything else, and it's mostly online based except for the in person master classes that you do while you're on the road. It it must be good to know that these people are pursuing higher education in music. This isn't, hey, I'm a hobbyist and I play drums at night when you know I, I hide in my garage for my wife and kids and, and beat on the drums and I like lactic, so I started taking Stanton Moore's drum academy lessons. It, is there something more fulfilling about teaching people that are pursuing this possibly to become professional musicians themselves? Yeah, and you know I love teaching people at all levels. Mm-hmm. I mean I love being able to to take a crowd that is not drummers right yeah, and be beginners. able to teach them yeah i mean absolute beginners and be able to teach them you know right and then one and two and three and four and then you teach them two and there's like you're basically playing a beat right now mm. right and if you start going and you get a bunch of people out there and they're doing that and then you say that'll work to so many different songs Right back in black, or it works with so many things, and you get a crowd of people doing that. You know, you take a couple minutes to to work with them on that, and then you take a few minutes to work with them on that, and then they're they're playing it, and it's like, and then you start playing drums with them, and they're like, oh my god, this is amazing. I'm I'm playing a beat maybe not exactly the same beat that goes with the song but it's a beat We're playing you know? with Stanton Moore yeah. yeah and so I love I love teaching people on all kinds of different levels that said it is fulfilling to take somebody who's put in time and effort who are at a at an intermediate or advanced level where where you say all right you know this of course you know that I know you, you knew that before you got to me but watch what you can do with it check this out and watching that light bulb go off like whoa i never thought to do with that to do that with it and then they can do it it's just application and they can do it and they're like whoa and then the next time you hear them they sound from here to here yeah because it's just they they could already physically do it they just hadn't conceptualized it yet they hadn't applied it yet that way yet when when you can take that kind of when you can make that kind of connection and you can make that kind of impact and you you can and then they start figuring it out on their own too you're just like man that's that's one of the greatest feelings Mm -hmm. in the world you know so so i I love that you know i love making that kind of a connection absolutely is there any specific gig or show or performance or festival where like you say the light bulb turned on for you with galactic where it was like Oh hell, boys! I think we we're we're making it. We're doing it. What what oh, was yeah. one of those moments that was like, this is the show in my head? Even maybe it was recently in the past ten or fifteen years, or it was in the first few years or a few months even, where it kind of snapped on where this is a thing that will last and live on forever beyond our own lives. Wow, that's a heavy. I, I know. Yeah, it is heavy. I, I just can't, I got carried away right then. Yeah, so. I don't know. I, I mean, hopefully we live on for some extended time uh, after we're gone. Who who knows? Who can say? Galactic's music will live on forever. Uh, well, thank you, Don't Tank. Worry. I appreciate Don't you worry. saying that. Right. Well, Stanton Moore's music will as well. But Galactic as a band, there there's, again, cutting you off on an answer. I don't know that there's any band, and I'll get to the, my, my final question that I have for you. We'll, we'll kind of state it all. You guys have kind of done it all and, and set a shining example on – on how this business should work for people if you're willing to put in the commitment to getting it done. Wow. But what you. is what is the, the performance that stands out as the moment that, that kind of became iconic for Galactic? Well, I, I mean, I'm going to tell you, and I'm not just saying this because we're, you know, sitting on this stage. But, I mean, I can't express growing up in New Orleans how much of a goal – it is to play at Tipitinas, wow. right? And the first time that Galactic played Tipitinas, opening up for Cowboy Mouth, I was like, "Man, this is this is something." Like we made it, boys. This is, <laughs> but it, it wasn't necessarily that we've made it, but it, it was 
wow, maybe we can make it. Mm -hmm. Like, if we can get on the stage of tips, then maybe anything is possible. Because when you're out there in the audience and you haven't played this stage yet, you're like, how do I get to this stage? And then once you do and you look up, and, you know, we were opening for Cowboy Mouth, so there were a couple people up there. But I'm looking up there, I'm like, man, one of these days, we're going to headline this Tipitina stage. And when we're, we're going to headline, and that whole balcony is going to be packed. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it was probably packed later in the night because it was... You know, at the time, Cowboy Mouth was drawing a lot of people. According to Robert, it was a sold-out show it, for yeah. Cowboy Mouth. But you're the opener, we were the so opener. people are still coming in. We were yeah. the opener, so people were still coming in. But it was that show, and I was like, man, maybe we can make it to where we can play this stage with that balcony full headlining. And then maybe then we will have made it. <laughs> <laughs> And well, never in a million years did I think, maybe one day we'll sit on this stage and play and that balcony will be full and we can say that we collectively own this, this endeavor. And never in a million years did I think I could sit on this stage with you and look in this, in this balcony empty and then think, you know what? I believe it. And I have hope, but one day we're going to fill this up again. Mm -hmm. Well, though they're not physically here, it's filled with people's hearts and souls. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, another uh, side note as far as uh, something that has occurred in the past few years that I thought was pretty interesting. Tell me a little bit about uh, sitting in with the band for Late Night with Seth Meyers. What, what is that like? Because yeah. I'm, I'm kind of a fan. I don't watch it often, but sometimes I do. And uh, obviously it's not rolling like it normally would, but they have a band, but they have rotating drummers every week yeah so nick when you edit this be on him i got emotional for a second <laughs> <laughs> did you i did man okay so i gotta let me uh take a sip of bourbon that that might help right? or it might just make make the tears come but uh, we're not editing that leave that in nick <laughs> don't you dare take that <laughs> i mean i'm cool if you leave it in right the I great mean, pete jones agrees with me i'm not i'm not bull <laughs> man that's how much this means to us it's, you know i, I assure you i i've I've quietly and uh, alone shed plenty of tears over this place myself. So. I don't let people see it, though. <laughs> I know. I can't imagine you shedding never tears. never on camera. Don't be a fool. I know, right? Well, you just <laughs> caught me on camera. Um, That's a gotcha question, Sam. <laughs> All right, hold on. Let me clean up for this Seth Meyers question. Yeah, no, it was... It was uh, sorry. Yeah. No, it's all right. I'm good. Take a minute. You're good. I'm good. So, yeah, tell, tell me a little bit about what it was like playing on Seth Meyers on it for a TV audience what's that like so that was fantastic I mean to be invited to do that right and one of the producers on the show Eric Lederman had the idea to start inviting special guest drummers and he reached out to me so I have to give props to him uh, he's become a friend and you know it's it was really cool just to get the call you know and and it was such a learning experience to learn how they do it, you know? So How do they do it? So the the music director told me that he had no idea how he was gonna pull it off when he first got the gig, right? They they wanted to do kind of like an indie rock band and to have Fred Armisen as the drummer. Mm -hmm. But then Fred, you know, he's is, busy. He's got this <laughs> this other job as a as an actor and so they kinda knew that they would have to get substitute drummers and and people to fill in for Fred so the musical director didn't really know how they were going to do it and he happened to bump into one of the members of the Roots in one of the elevators at 30 Rock and and he said man how do y'all do it like how do y'all remember all of those walk-ins and walk you know and and walk-ons and how do y'all remember all those going to commercial little bits? He said, oh man, it's really easy. He said, what do you mean it's really easy? He said, well, we rehearse in the day and then we make up little things and then we record it. And then right before a guest is gonna walk out, when Seth is talking, they're playing the little bit over and over. And you just played it earlier that day and it's a recording of you. 
Yeah. So you're just listening to that, and the musical director is smiling, and yeah, yeah. And then when they're, when they're about to do the, when they're about to walk the guest on, they give you, you know, three, four, and then there you are. Mm. And you're playing what you were just listening to, right? Uh. And, of course, it's not going to be an exact replica, but it's going to be basically that. Yeah. And then you do that for going to commercial as well, and you do that for the walk-ons. And you're, you've got everybody's got in-ear monitors, mm. and, and you're all listening to what you're about to play from a recording you made earlier that day. Mm -hmm. And you, re you rehearse for several hours that day and then record it all. And then you use what you recorded as a cue to remind you of what exactly you're supposed to be playing. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's easy because of the rehearsal then, I guess. It's, it's, it's easy seamless. because of the preparation. Yeah. Just like when I walk out here on stage and, and, and play with Galactic to me, it's easy. But if I were to go walk out on stage right now with no drums and no audience, it would be impossible. Mm -hmm. But it's because of the preparation. It's because of, you know, our crew and, and the band rehearsing and learning all the music and and the sound check that we've done and, and the gear being right and that I can just walk on and, and do it. But it's 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 only doable because of all that preparation that so many people put in. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 I wouldn't say it's easy, but it, it's doable because of the preparation. So after three decades of being a professional musician i wonder with just the the amount of music that you have in your head I, I can't imagine the amount of songs you've had to learn over these decades when i was in here talking with another drummer andre boren i asked him about his playing the piano which is and unbelievable he played yeah, he played phenomenal piano no sheet music no nothing he just had it memorized and i said how long does it take you to memorize that sort of thing his answer was kind of strange. It was more or less, I don't have it memorized. I have the muscle memory of it. it it's, it's not even that he's specifically thinking about what he's playing. He's just played it enough times that his hands are almost working independently of his mind. Do you find that happening while you're playing drums? Yes. Sometimes, yes. And for me, memorization is something that I wouldn't say is one of my strongest suits right because I don't do it all the time I learn a song and I can usually in most situations I can kind of play my version of it right mm -hmm. but what Andre does I mean playing note for note classical pieces I mean over an hour of material memorized to me that's that's astounding mm -hmm. it's just like oh my god that's it's like, to me, just, you know, of course we see classical pianists and they're playing, but a lot of times they're reading. To have mm. all that memorized, to me, is just, is just mind-blowing. Well, more often than not, piano is the, the instrument that they play all day, every day. And he's also playing guitar and bass, and he's playing drums. And like, he's a hell of a drummer. Yeah. He's a great drummer. He can actually sing a little yeah. bit, too. Yeah. So Andre's musical abilities to me are just astounding. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, oh, I, I think I'm a musician. It's like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Andre is, is beyond impressive to me. Just um, amazing. And such a sweetheart of a guy, yeah, you know? Absolutely. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's super, super impressive. So you don't find the amount of material, I guess maybe it's it's not so difficult you make it seem so seamless in that the one thing that people forget is that you're playing all day you're playing every day like there's when's the last time you went a day without playing drums in some fashion yeah i mean even if my wife takes some time and and go somewhere or you know might try to take some time off i still like to wake up in the morning and practice wow. you know i like to practice for maybe an hour hour and a half or more every morning just as first thing in the morning yeah just wow. as an eye opener because sometimes my days get away from me and and i'll have studio stuff or i'll have rehearsals and gigs so i've come to find that i make coffee so lately it's been i make coffee for my wife and i and i usually wake up before she does and i usually practice for an hour and an hour and a half 
before she wakes up, and then we have coffee together. On the bus touring, I'll wake up usually most before most of the band and practice. For years, I was practicing brushes, mm -hmm. and now I'll practice on a pad. But luckily, on the pad, into the bunk hall, they don't hear it. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, much to the chagrin of your wife, I'm sure you waking up and playing drums before so she's I awake. I've, so I've put these mesh heads and perforated cymbals, um, low, Zildjian low volume cymbals and mm. Remo silent stroke heads on the drums at the house mm. through all of this so that now when I wake up, she doesn't hear it. Yeah, also the folks on the other side of the wall next door. <laughs> yeah, too. which is helpful. They're super cool and they're amazing and we're friends with them. But, but yeah, also they don't complain too. So I really like waking up and... And usually, keep in mind, it's, it's practicing on pads, mm -hmm. um, so I'm not waking people up. Mm -hmm. So it's either on the bus or in the hotel or at home. I just wake up and I try to practice for an hour, an hour and a half on pads or with brushes um, before I even open the computer or look at the phone or, you know, try to get that in. And that keeps me at a certain level. And then I'll start learning songs or doing sessions or rehearsals or gigs mm -hmm. or whatever it is that I've got to do. Uh, something that we didn't talk about, and I, you know, we've, we've been here for a while, you've been super generous with your time, so I'll start finding a way to ramp down in a little while after, after another question or two. The early days of touring with Galactic, uh, we, we heard some stories from Rob about you guys piling into your folks' van uh, <laughs> and Houseman being extremely generous to you and kind of taking you under his wing. Uh, at least to give you not just a little bit of extra, you know, the, the vocals on stage and the performance, but to just give you guys a little bit of guidance in this industry. Uh, are there any stories that stick out about those those first tours in your folks' van? Yeah. Now that we think about it, it's just it's just amazing that that we were able to get the ball rolling that way. I mean, you know, we bought my parents. 1978 van mm. the same van that i went to disney world in <laughs> when i was like seven or eight years old and i went back to disney world when i was like 16 in the same van, same van. <laughs> and it was the van that i got you know dropped off and picked up from grammar school and you know early high school in and and it, so then we wound up you know taking it on the road and you know our first trips were like leaving new orleans 24 hours to Colorado, played mm -hmm. two nights in Colorado, 24 hours to Vancouver, and then worked our way all the way down the West Coast back to New Orleans. That was like five weeks, I think, that mm -hmm. first tour. And we were with, with Farrell mm -hmm. DeCluitt, the house man, and who, you know, I just absolutely love and who was such a huge part of my life. I mean, like a father figure, like an older brother, like an uncle, like a mentor, you know, he was such a teacher to us, and I've learned so much from him, and I'm still learning from him mm. in in the things that he might have said that I didn't get at the time, or the, the situations that we were in that I didn't get at the time. So I'm still learning from him, and what's astounding to me is that when he first got in the van with us, we are now about the same age as he was then <laughs> when he got in that 1978 Ford Econoline van that we didn't even know if we would make it past Baton Rouge. <laughs> so, you know, the, the level of, of, of some trust, some belief, some hope, a mix of all those things, that he must have had in what we could do together, you know, to me means means so much because I realize, you know, how much that would take for me at this age to take such a leap of faith. Yeah, you know? is, there's probably no band out there that you'd be willing to, hey, guys, yeah, I'd be happy to get in your mom's van and drive to Canada. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll find a place that we can sleep that's indoors, you know. Right. And he took that leap of faith with us, you know. So, I mean, that's, that's just... Uh, it, it really, it's really hit home when I started realizing that, you know. It's, it's astonishing. The early talks of 
when it seemed like a real possibility that, hey, do you think that we could actually own Tipitina's? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, I think at some point we probably started kidding about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe as long as 10 years ago, like, Mm -hmm. you know, just totally not serious just one like one day wouldn't well, it be great yeah if- well yeah we'll do that when we own the place you know mm-hmm. like as a total totally just out there blurting it out not really thinking it could ever be a possibility but i think that we had blurted things out like that between each other for years and then we do have to give kudos and credit to our manager alex brawl mm-hmm. who in his dealings with Roland von Kurnatowski, when we did a festival in conjunction with Roland, we, Alex started realizing, he's like, man, Roland, you're not going to want to own that place forever. Mm-hmm. Like, what do you want to do with it? When you want to sell it, let us know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and at first we were like, we can't believe you said that to him. He's like, <laughs> he's like, what? He's like, you know, Nobody can own something forever. That includes us, you know? We don't look at ourselves as the owners. We look at ourselves as the current caretakers, Mm -hmm. right? Who can hopefully take good enough care of it to to pass it on to the next generation or the next, you know, group of people who are going to appreciate it and love it and look after it as much as as we will, you know? So No time soon, hopefully. uh, No time soon, (laughs) hopefully. Um, and you we, guys won't be able to walk around hopefully by then. Yeah, hopefully we won't. Hopefully oh, they'll be Jesus. wheeling us in here. But, you know, I mean, we've got a lot of work to do, you know, uh, to, to take care of it and see it through, especially what what we're going through right now. But we're willing to put that in, you know. And, mm. and so if not us, then who, you know? Who right now loves this place as much as we do? Who's played here as much as we do? There's, there is someone who's played here more than you. I'm sure. Well, Bruce Daggerpont, we know Bruce that. Bruce Daggerpont holds the record. I'll go ahead and cut you off and give some props to Bruce uh, Daggerpont. Absolutely. Bruce Daggerpont Cajun Band. Bruce Daggerpont has performed here an estimated over 1,400 times. Yeah. Um, and we'll you, never You guys ain't going to hit that number. No, we'll never hit that. But what I was going to say is who's played here as much as we have that might also be able to get into position mm-hmm. to to buy it and and – and take care of it for now so i wasn't trying to say that we we played more than anybody else i was was trying to say who's played here as much and might be able to do it and as a has a basically a you know five man group of of guys who's kind of like a board of directors and and basically we agree on most things and we have for at the time that we that we closed on tips it was 20 three and a half years, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going on 25 years, we've agreed on most things and have been together. So we we felt like, well, if, if not us, then who? Mm. Well, I, the answer is nobody. (laughs) (laughs) I, 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 we couldn't ask for a better board of directors. Absolutely. And the, the Bruce thing, I just, I love Bruce Daggerpont so much. He's a sweetheart. Oh Um, yeah. One day I'm going to have him on here and I love to have him talk my ear off. I love hearing him tell stories as well. Um, yeah, you, you guys have accomplished so much, absolutely, and you deserve every bit of it. Um, and again, like I said, we, we've been talking for a long time, so I don't want to have to keep you too late. So I will ask you this one thing, this, something that kind of occurred to me. Besides Galactic, name another group out there that has collaborated with as many artists in studio and on stage live, headlined and sold out as many venues, played as many major music festivals around the world, produced their own records, produced so many other artists' records, built their own studio, and bought their favorite music venue. What's what's the other band that's done that? I'm sure you're going to... Bruce Daggerpont? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is nobody, but Bruce, we still love you anyway. <laughs> Uh, Stanton, thank you so much. Uh, for anyone out there, check out stantonmore.com. Uh, stantonmore.com is the website, right? Stantonmoredrumacademy.com. Uh, Stantonmore Drum Academy. You have both URLs, though, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But check out the Stantonmore Drum Academy. Uh, go on YouTube, watch all the videos, uh, the interviews, and, the, yeah, the instructional videos are phenomenal, especially 
Uh, maybe you feel like getting into drums. Maybe your kid feels like getting into drums. Pass it along, spread it, and let uh, his work educate others. And again, thank you so much for everything that you've done and everything you've given. We'll do this again because there's a thousand other things that I can continue to ask you. This is only part one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Cheers, man. Cheers, brother. Cheers, brother. Thank you much. Yes, indeed. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, all right, all right. Welcome to the world famous Tipitinas. Thank you to Stan and Galactic and Tipitinas for allowing us to use the space. Uh, thank you to Nugs.net for all the great content and the usage of the equipment. Thank you to the great Pete Jones on Light and Sound. Uh, thank you to uh, Tanner Logan on being the director of photography, working the cameras. Thank you to Nick Logan for being an executive producer and editor. And uh, my name is Tank. Thank you so much. Stanton, thank you. Cheers, brother. And thanks to Tank for all the hard work that he has put into Tipitina's. This place would not be running as smoothly as it has for the last several years if it wasn't for you. That's Cheers sweet to of you, you to say. Cut that indeed. part out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't take compliments well. All right, repeat after me. One hen. One hen. One hen, two ducks. One hen, two ducks. One hen, two ducks, three squawking geese. One hen, two ducks, three squawking geese. One hen, two ducks, three squawking geese, four <laughs> limerick oysters. One hen, two ducks, three <laughs> squawking geese, four limerick oysters. One hen, two ducks, three squawking geese, four limerick oysters, five corpulent porpoises. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stan. Thank you, Tank. Mm.